Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sunless Sea. My name is Splattercat and I'm excited to show you this game here today. It's a game that was kind of off of my radar and I hadn't really thought about because it was based on the world around a browser game called Fallen London. And yet the more and more I looked into this game and kind of the lore behind the game, the more excited I got about it because it very much reminds me of Arkham Horror and a lot of the games that surround the Cthulhu mythos and things like that. It very much seems to be sort of not derivative. I won't say derivative because that seems slightly disrespectful. But what I will say is that it seems to focus on like darkness and terror and kind of the mist on the horizon and the things you can't see rather than the things that you can and so what is Sunless Sea? Sunless Sea is a sailing roguelike with a not a persistent storyline but it's definitely got a storyline that you're trying to eke out in which you take control of a captain of a ship who's trying to manage your crew, trying to make sure that everybody stays fed, everybody stays, you know, unterrified, because terror is a very real thing that you have to keep control of in this game, and also that you don't get eaten by any of the nasty things out in the darkness. It's a game of exploration, and so in a lot of ways, it's a game like Sid Meier's Pirates, where you go around, you explore, you just have adventures, and a lot of the storyline is emergent. You're kind of making the storyline as you go along, not necessarily having one put in front of you, and I think that's a very attractive quality for Sunless Sea. And so without further to say about it, I think given the fact that this is the first episode, I'd very much like to get started and talk about the game and play the game. We may die. I mean, this is a game that I'm not incredibly familiar with. I've played three or four hours so far. I'm familiar with all of the newbie areas, and I'm fairly familiar with some of the things that you're going to sail out further and encounter. I think we'll probably get a couple episodes out before I die anyways. It is a roguelike, obviously, but we'll play probably a couple playthroughs of this because I do think that this is a very fun game, and I'd like to complete it. I'd like to actually win, and so... Welcome. Thank you for coming and joining my LP of Sunless Sea. I look forward to learning the game along with you and seeing if maybe we can come out the other end of this as a veteran explorer. Let's go ahead and click New Game. Uh, yes, I am indeed sure. And though it's going to throw us into a quick loading screen, this game is very charming. I like it a lot. And so here we are, the captain's making. Three decades ago, in the reign of Victoria, London was stolen by bats. Now it lies a mile below the surface. That's not important. What's important is the vast black sea beyond London, a sea which is yours to explore. So we can say that we have a path that, uh, past that's wreathed in shadows, which means we can decide later. We don't really, as this goes along, I don't know. I don't do this very often because I like choosing my stats as I go along. Or we can choose a past, which allows us to decide who we were and what we are meant to be, or what we want to be. Choose a past, and so we'll continue. Okay, so now you're a captain. Now you belong to the Unterzee, but who were you before? We can say that we're a street urchin, which gives us a bonus to veils. The stats system in this game is very odd, and it's going to take some time because they haven't named things like strength, intelligence, wisdom. Instead, they've opted to go with a bunch of systems that are named different things. And so you've got hearts, which is your ability to inspire, heal, and defend. And it helps with tests that surround terror. We've got veils, which is the speed, stealth, and deception stat, and it improves your evasion abilities in combat. You've got Pages, which is esoteric and occasionally practical knowledge. It increases the speed at which you convert your fragments into secrets. Fragments are XP. I'll save you a whole bunch of time right there. You get fragments for completing tasks and by raiding other ships and doing things like that. And so it took me a while to realize, like, you just have to convert in your head into common knowledge what certain things are. Because they've taken random things like experience and just renamed them other things like fragments. And so once you start making the connections between what is what, the game gets a whole lot more smooth. But your first half an hour in this game is going to be like, okay, what the hell does this do? Alright, what the hell does this do? And you'll just be flipping between different tabs and trying to figure stuff out. There is a slight learning curve, but once you get over it, I think you do have a pretty rewarding gameplay experience. We've got mirrors, detection and perception it improves your illumination abilities in combat. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's not going to make a whole lot of sense based on the way that I'm describing it, but believe me, mirrors are very important. The skill of mirrors, anyways. And then we have iron, which is your destroy ability. Allows you to improve your attack damage in combat. Finally, we've got the amount of crew that we have. We have 8 out of 10 men on board. And these are our crew cards right here. We have the surgeon, the gunnery officer, the cook, the chief engineer, and the first officer. And then, of course, ourselves. We have our mascot, which is a comatose ferret, mostly. It's immobile. Occasionally, it's feral. Well, I hope I'm not around when it decides to be feral, because ferret bites hurt like hell. they got little weasel teeth. Just meh. And they bite you, and it's quite stingy. It's like getting bit by a rat, which I've had the misfortune of taking part in before. It sucks. Being bit by a rat is terrible. So now that I've explained the stats, this first episode might be a little bit uneventful. That's going to be the disappointing part about this, because there's a lot of stuff to explain. There's a lot of things to look at. There's a lot of things for me to tell you what they do. Otherwise, in the context of the LP, it's going to appear like I'm just clicking stuff and making decisions, and you're not going to be in the know about what it is that I'm doing. And so we can be a street urchin. Now that we've talked about the stats, that'll give us a bonus to our stealth abilities, Veils. 
we can be a poet, which makes us more educated. It makes us a little bit of a scientist or an observer. Gives us a bonus to pages, the skill of trickery and knowledge. We can be a veteran, which gives us a bonus to irons, which makes us deal a lot more damage. We can be a priest, which gives us a bonus to hearts, so that we inspire people a little bit better, and we can also heal. Or we can go with the natural philosopher, which I think there's a little bit of nomenclature. I mean, the poet says that it's the hero of knowledge, but really a natural philosopher historically was basically a scientist. And so this one gives you... I don't know, I, I guess, suppose that they distinguish between philosophers and poets by this one is more applied knowledge, whereas this one is the gathering of knowledge. And so mirrors, this gives you a bonus to mirrors if you're the natural philosopher. Additionally, when you take the natural philosopher, you get a surgeon crewman. If you go with, it's kind of, I don't know how it's organized, but if you go with the poet, you get a navigator, which gives you a bonus. Basically, every single one of these comes with a random crewman that gives you a bonus in some other area and helps you round out your abilities. Today, I think we're going to go with... Oh, I don't know. I've done Poet, and I've done Natural Philosopher. My best experience has been with Poet because it allows you to convert your fragments into level-ups very, very rapidly. Level-ups are called secrets, by the way. It's basically every time you collect enough fragments, XP quote-unquote, you will get a secret, and the secret is basically a level up. You turn it into one of your crewmen to increase your stats, or you can trade in your level ups for more valuable stuff back at town. Essentially, just recognize that fragments are XP and secrets are level ups, and your life will be a whole lot easier. Basically, the terminology of this game is going to trip you up pretty rapidly when you first start playing. I think we're going to go with, let's go with the street urchin. We'll go with subtlety and evasion. And so when we got the, we got this bandana, oh, we got a gunnery officer. That's kind of cool. A Longshanks is a recent, a Longshanks is a recent graduate from the Urchant Gangs. But where did she learn to fire a cannon? Iron plus one. So another thing is this game is based on a whole lore that is not necessarily popular or written about. And so the lore of this game is totally based on a browser game that I don't think a ton of people have played. I haven't. I've never even heard of it. And so it's called Fallen London. And I would strongly recommend if you've got the extra time on your hands, play Fallen London first before you play this game. Because this game is constantly making allusions and references to things that I have no idea what they're talking about. It's sort of like if you come into Shadowrun the first time and you have no idea what's happened in Seattle or the UCAS. You have no idea what's happened in California or in Germany. And you're just kind of flying blind. The thing is, this game does not go out of its way to explain anything to you. Most of the time, it seems like they kind of just hand wave it and they're like, oh, don't worry about it. Just keep playing. And so I wish that the game actually gave you a bit more lore to chew on if you wanted it. Like essentially like every village would have like a thing that you could click on where you could just learn the lore. Because a lot of the time I feel like I'm flying blind in this game and I have no idea what's going on. I'm sure there's a wiki or something that I could have used in order to educate myself further. But as it stands right now, I'm largely ignorant of all the cool things in this game that will be occurring. And so, down here as a result, it says your friend, another Longshanks, knows a little of gunnery. Only a little, but she can help. I don't know what they're talking about. By Longshanks. I suppose a Longshanks is somebody that's an urchin or a gang member would be my guess. And so we get a Longshanks gunner. We get 25 veils. We get 10 echoes. The echoes are the coins. The echo is the currency for the game. And so now we're a Z captain. We're no longer a stranger. And so welcome to the world. We'll continue. And so this is the... Oh, we've got to choose. Okay, so what does winning the game mean to you? That's another thing that I like is the game allows you to define your own victory parameters. You don't have to win this game by any means that you don't want to. Now, because the game is in beta, it means that a lot of the content is in the game, but a lot of the end game content is not. So the end game content that you're going to be kind of contesting with right now are these two. These are the only two stories that you can pick at the moment. But as you can see, there are going to be five when the game is totally completed. So the game is not an alpha. It's in beta, so just bear that in mind. This is early access, but it's gone. Most of the content is in the game. Right now, they're just bug squashing, and they're adding in the final endings to all of the different stories. I'm going to go with, you can go with Fulfillment, which means that you gather 100 tales, learn all you can of the Z, and then write a masterpiece. And then you retire off the profits. Kind of interesting. This relies on you to go all over the world exploring and finding stories. Basically, there will be these little items that you pick up called Tales of X, and so it'll be like Tales of Woe, Tales of Happiness, Tales of Sorrow, Tales of Terror, Tales of Illumination, Tales of Learning, and once you have enough of them, you can come back and you compile all the tool, or I'm sorry, all the tales into a book. And once you've written the book, you'll complete the game and you win. Or you can go with wealth, and so you know how it is to be poor. Now you want a mansion, servants, and fine clothes, a family perhaps. So this one's going to rely on you basically having the best lodgings in town, and once you've acquired all of the nicest things that you can purchase in London, you've essentially won the game and it'll end. We're going to go with fulfillment because that's the explorer's journey. That's going to be the one where you live the life of kind of a Vasco da Gama or an Amerigo Vespucci 
or, you know, just the explorer's life. You're going to be sailing all over the place looking for new stuff. And that's the thing that fulfills you. And so here we are. We'll go with fulfillment. And so it says... Whenever you return to Fallen London, you have an option of retiring, but you'll need to write your masterwork first. You've gained an occurrence. Your ambition quality has now become London's most venerated explorer. And so you have a quality, and it's just like what your aspirations are. If we go for riches, this would have just said wealth. You would have wanted to be wealthy, but now it says ambition because that's what the quality we're after. Let's continue. I mean, getting rich is pretty sweet, but I think being fulfilled is better. We get to choose our title right now. We can be Captain, My Lady, My Lord, Citizen, Sir, or Madam. I'm going to go with My Lord. Okay. And so, a pleasure to welcome you on board, My Lord. And so, now we can continue. And we're going to choose our portrait and choose a name. We're going to go with Lord Dappingtonshire. There we are. Lord Dappingtonshire. Who will write the most awesome book of his travels that has ever been compiled. And then there's a lot of portraits you can have right here. Kind of a person with a graduation cap on. I forget what that thing's called. It's got a specific name. I had to wear one like four months ago when I graduated. We've got kind of this frumpy looking madam. We've got... She's got tentacles growing out of her head. And I think I know where this is going. So we're going to avoid that. We've got kind of a gypsy. We've got a scientist lady. Down to the gentleman. We have your standard sailor. He's probably got a Donegal beard with no mustache. We've got this guy right here who's drinking heavily. I don't think I'm going to start the adventure off by drinking heavily. We are piloting a massive hunk of iron across the seas, and so that seems like a bad idea. Lord Dappingtonshire, that seems to be about the right thing for me. I mean, this guy's got a pipe, but he's also bald. I'm not feeling the baldness, so I think I'll go with him right there. He's got an awesome mustache. He's a little bit... He looks like he's filled out well enough. He's been eating recently. He's got himself a fine ear right there on the side and also a very fancy hat and mustache, and I think that's all it's going to take for me. And so there it is. Now... At all times in game. So let's go through some of the UI elements right here so that you know what we're looking at and so that you can help me keep an eye on all the different gameplay aspects that we need to be aware of. We have first and foremost our speed. And so this is going to be the speed, everything from a minus two all the way up to a plus two. And so that's going to be full sails ahead where you're just like, bam, full speed. And then you could do anything in between. Now, if you're at full speed, your boiler temperature will go up or your engine temperature, which can be seen right here by mousing over this, our amount of fuel that's left and how many fuel tanks we have left which is nine. As we travel, this will slowly decrease. We've got our hunger. When our hunger gets up to this threshold right here, everyone will eat, and we have five supplies. Are we actually... Oh, we're not paused right now. Let me pause the game because we're accruing hunger, hunger as we sit here in the docks. The game doesn't start out paused. I thought that it did. So we've got five supplies right here. Every time they get up to here, this will go down, but you can also trade supplies when you go to different ports. We've got our terror meter. This is very, very important because this can get you into a lot of trouble. If it gets high up, you have screw-ups, bad things happen. If you keep your boiler too heated, you catch fire. Lots of bad things happen. Basically, you don't want any of your meters to be full except for fuel. This meter, you want it to be empty. This meter, you want it to be empty. This meter, you want it to be empty. That's all you need to know. We have our hull. And then we also have over here our hold capacity, which is 14 out of 40, which I almost forgot about, but I remembered as we were going along. If you forgot, we have our stats over here. We are very, very good at veils. We are a master of veils. The game is a little bit different in that it allows you to start out with a 50 is the maximum stat you can have. It's a little bit different in that it allows you to start off with one of your things. Absolutely, you're just a master of that thing. You're good at it. Hands down. You are the king of whatever that ability is. And so it's a little bit different in that regard. A lot of games don't do that. You level everything slowly and you start with a minor bonus. In this game, they feel like you're doomed anyway, so they just give you that head up by allowing you to be a master of a certain stat when you first start out at the bottom. We have our Z-Bat, which we can send out. It'll find islands. It flies off in the direction of an island and then comes back and it allows us to find the nearest area that we can explore at. We've got our lights. As long as your lights are on, your terror goes up slower. But if your lights are off and you're sailing, it goes up very, very rapidly. Still, if your lights aren't on, you don't attract the attention of nasty monsters that are trying to kill you. So it's kind of a little bit of this, a little bit of that. What do you want? Do you want your, tailor, or do you want your sailors to go insane or do you want monsters to attack you? Either way, your journey is probably going to suck at least a little bit. We've got Repair the Ship, which costs you supplies. Full power, obviously, allows you to sail. We can resume the game. That's going to be the pause. The Gazetteer is what we were looking at before. The Gazetteer. It allows you to go to different areas in town, and so there's shops here. We can go to the Caminus Yards. We can go to Caro's Naval Surplus. Lots and lots of stuff here that you can get yourself all kinds of interesting items that you can trade all throughout the lands. We'll kind of tab through those in a little bit. We've got the Shipyard, where we can upgrade our ship. And so we can get the Escatalog Dreadnought, which is far better than what we have right now. You lose Veils for doing it, which I think would not be the best choice for us. We've got the Lampad class Cutter. Obviously, there are a lot of things here 
that we want to upgrade to in the future. There are a lot of ships. There are a lot of interesting things that you want. We can go the Caligo class merchant cruiser, which is a little bit of your Indian frigate that you can take out. Or I'm sorry, the Indian, I forget what it's called. It's been a long time since I've played any sailing games. Frigates or warships. This would be named something else. It's called an India something. I don't know. It's been a long time. Nonetheless, we don't have any money right now, so we're not going to be able to afford any of this. But we started with a Lagaya-class steamer, which is okay. It's a tramp steamer that served well, but for a long, long time. It's got a decent hull. It's got an okay hold. It's got decent weight and a little bit of quarters. I mean, it's not the best thing that we could have, but obviously it's the starting ship. I mean, it is what it is. Over here on this side, we've got the Boltitude's House of Vision, where we can buy new lamps for our ship. If we go to our hold, you can see here that we can equip all kinds of good stuff. Whether it's auxiliary stuff, decks, aft, port, bridge, we've got our engines and our guns. We start with a light gun. It's not very good. It's okay. It'll get us by. We can go to the Caminus Yards, which is where we get assistance, I guess. I don't know. This is kind of I don't know what a lot of these do. So this one gives us a bunch of irons. It's a heart ender. A powerful weapon that permits flensing attacks. I don't even know what flensing means. A Caminus Yard Hell Thrasher. Gives us iron plus 20, so I assume that it's good. We've also got pneumatic delivery. So it's a rat sender. Go rats where rats are required pneumatically. So it fires rats as far as I can tell. In combat, deploys ratus faber assistance for quicker repairs. Okay, so it allows us to uh, e it allows us to repair our ship faster, so it lowers the cooldown on that. And then right here, ratus faber assistance are essential for the use of pneumatic rat. Okay, so that's gonna be the ammo. It looks like for this right here. And so as I said, there are loads and loads of things in this game. Like this is really one of those games that I can see a lot of people coming up with unique builds and things to interest themselves along the way. I mean, the game just has a tremendous amount of things and like metagame knowledge to just soak in as you play. And luckily you don't really need to go through all of this as you're playing right now. You could really just kind of jump out into the darkness and enjoy things. So Caro's Naval Surplus is going to allow you to buy weapons it looks like. Mrs. Plenty's Shipside Provisioners is going to allow you to buy fuel, Foxfire Candles, which one of those? We've all made mistakes, if only those mistakes could be left in the dark. I suppose that that's a trade good, because it's got a fairly large markup. It's got a 40 buy and a sell right there, so that's going to be expensive. We've got supplies that we can buy. Obviously, as I said before, you can either trade those or they lower your hunger whenever it gets to this threshold right here. I don't think you can drag that or move it around. The wolf stack exchange is where you start out and it's just got a bunch of random trade goods that you can take all over the place if you're interested. I've traded casks of mushroom wine. I've traded muter salts. I've done a couple things in past playthroughs that allowed you to either trigger events or trade with people to get a little bit of extra money along the way. For example, I know a good way for us to use mushroom wine. You can actually sell the mushroom wine at a very, very good profit off to the southeast. We've got the Iron and Misery Company, which gives you all kinds of engines and things. And so that'll be useful if we wanted to go a little bit faster. But we've got about 10 minutes left in the episode. So let's actually do some exploring, shall we? Actually, we've got about 7 minutes. So let's do this thing. In order to start the game, we're going to launch our ship unpause and then we'll launch and so there it is we're off and on our way the controls work with WASD if you press the D key I'm sorry if you press W it makes you go forward faster and you can see right here as I press W a or we can press W and S I can lower and I can increase the amount of steam that we're putting on there it is right there now as you're at the maximum boil right here you're going to increase your temperature you may end up burning your ship so be careful you also use up more fuel but let's start exploring so what's the point of exploring well as you explore you gather these things called port reports, and you can bring them back to London because London, the portmaster here, likes to know about the comings and goings that take place all throughout the area. And so as you gain these reports, oh, we've got an enemy right there. Let's go ahead and kill the lights. There we are. And so we've discovered Hunter's Keep. And so what you can see right here is that we've gained a little bit of XP by discovering other areas. I don't want to mess with that ship right there right now. I don't know what that is, and it's larger than us, so I feel like it might be slightly terrifying. This crab is going to run up on us, and we will be able to defeat them. It says June 30th, 1892. We hear distant bells. Well, we don't want to run into the shoal right there. We want to avoid that. Let's go up to Hunter's Keep, and we'll take a look around and see if there's anything interesting occurring up here. Let's put on full speed for the moment. We're going to try and cut through this little... Oh, I don't even know what to call this right here, but we're going to risk it. Ooh, we made it. We snuck by. When you crash, you will take hull damage, so be aware of that. Let's go ahead and take a look at Hunter's Keep. We're going to cut that very, very close because we want to make the maximum amount of good out of our supplies as we can. Our terror is up slightly by 10. 
the Z is wide and dark, terror is increasing. But as you can see, these little pips along the side of our terror are yellow, which means that it's going up slowly because the lights are on. Those actually turn red and it goes up by doubles if you have the lights out, which can be very, very bad. Let's go ahead and we'll investigate Hunter's Keep, a hump of dark rocks swathed in mist like a hundred other Unterzee islands. Well, not really a fan of getting humped by dark rock, but we'll go with it. I am a geologist, so if I was going to love anything, it would be rocks. And so it says, by, but, so it says a hump of dark rock swathed in mist like a hundred other Unter Z islands, but here's a grand house, windows, windows aglow, lawns and possibly green and lush in the false starlight, raked gravel paths. You stand on the dock as the sea nudges the ship's tides, or the ship's sides, an unexpectedly warm breeze carries the faintest trace of lavender. We can present ourselves with the house and made ourselves known, which will... Oh, I don't know. Well, anyways, these usually, this is just a whole bunch of lore nonsense that doesn't make any sense unless you know the context. We can walk in the gardens, which takes a couple of burly sailors with us, just in case, but the gardens are tranquil as moonlight. We can reconnoiter the island, the plunging cliffs, soft green lawns, a well tucked away in a fold of the grounds. Is there anything else? Let's go ahead and we'll scout, and this should give us, yeah, a port report for Hunter's Keep. And so now, ships rarely come here, nothing changes, even the weather. The house is the heart of the island, the house and the sisters, but the Admiralty may be happy to know that nothing's changed at least. And so we gain one, a port report, Hunter's Keep. And so we can take that back to London and we can change it in for cash and experience. Because, as I said before, you gain experience in this game by exploring first and foremost. And those port reports are the proof that you've gone out and explored. Now we can make ourselves known, we can spy on the house. It says it's a straightforward challenge based on our veils, and so we have a 100% chance of success. Let's go for it. And so it says, you peer through a half-open French window into a grand parlor, grand in size if a little reduced in style by dust and neglect. A dark-haired, pale-skinned young woman bends earnestly over piano keyboard. Another, fair-haired but unmistakably her sister, sprawls on the sofa with a book. A third sits by the fireplace, staring sorrowfully into the embers. Soon, she says, and the piano music falters and stops. We'll go hungry, and then the end will come for me. But not for you. The pianist raises her eyes from the keyboard. Oh, hush. We don't speak of it. She frowns. Has she seen you at the window? You withdraw. You gain 40 fragments. Okay, and so we got 40 XP from that. And so now we have 90. We know something of Hunter's Keep. And so we've been known to visit the sisters of Hunter's Keep. And we've succeeded in a Veils challenge. The higher the quality, the higher the chance of success. Alright, and so now we have the choice to either present ourselves since we know what's waiting for us. And why not? Let's do it. You knock and enter. A maid with smoldering topaz eyes shows you into the parlor where three young women await. A visitor, the youngest cries. The youngest chuckles, the eldest sighs. Do excuse the indecorum, she says. Visitors are rare, but you are very welcome. I'm Cynthia. The noisy one is Phoebe, and the cheerful one is Lucy. You're in good time for lunch. Will you join us? So now we have a couple of options. We can choose which sister that we want to lunch in with. We can lunch in with Cynthia. She's the eldest, melancholy, pensive, and occasionally dramatic. And it's going to unlock when something awaits you. Okay. Lunch in with the sister Lucy. Lucy, the middle sister, is sunny, restless, and prone to giggles. Or we can lunch in with the sisters Phoebe. Phoebe is soft-voiced, watchful, and unpredictable. And so, oh, news, news. When the sisters aren't feeling sociable, they could be tempted out of their lair by the smell of new stories. I forgot to get that. So in London, you can sit around on the street corner and you can gather rumors, which you can trade in with some of the colonial-type people off in the distant islands for benefits. I mean, you never know if it's going to be a benefit or a detriment. Some people seem to lose their shit in this game and kind of crucify you and kill you randomly. This game is quite dangerous. I suppose we'll go with Phoebe. She's watchful and unpredictable. Well, let's stay predictable. Let's go with Cynthia. Cynthia grasps your arm and whispers to you. Her eyes are wide and blue. Her hair is wild and tangled. Bats might nest in it. It seems to you that you are sitting on a hillside above a wide blue lake, listening to a story of murder, an axe, a net, blood on scented water. Another chop, Cynthia asks. You've barely touched your food. Here, I'll have the maid wrap something up for you. And so we gain supplies, and she seems slightly crazy, so I think I'm going to stay away from the crazy one for right now because I've taken that chance in real life and never go with the crazy one. That's what I will say. The female crazy one? Eh, avoid her. Not quite so and not quite so adventurous as you might think. Definitely turns into like a five year debacle in which you pretty much come out the worst for wear. And so we gained one terror. We also gain a tale of terror. That's good because that's one of the things that we need in order to complete our book. Very, very good. And so we are now acquainted with the sisters of Hunter's Keep. We'll continue. Not really a whole lot else for us to do right here. 
And so we could go back in, but since we're not invited and they seem sort of crazy, I'm not going to go back in. It says that the parlor is empty, and I'm not down with that. They're going to be sitting back behind a corner waiting to stab my ass or something. But we'll come back when we got news from the mainland, I guess. Let's go ahead and embark. And so in launching, you can play this game in two modes. You can play it in merciful mode, or you can play it in kind of the hardcore mode where you die if you get killed. Let's turn off the lights because that guy is searching for us right there. And I've never seen a wandering ship that was good news. I'll just throw that out there for right now, but the wandering ship seemed to be really, really bad for me. Let's go ahead and check out this ship down here and see what there is to report. I don't know if we have to approach them stealthily. They are using their search lamp right now. And so we've discovered Rowena's rocks, which has given us a few extra fragments. Let's go ahead and lower our speed, and we'll come in to dock with this ship and see what they have to say. It's a light ship, so it's basically just here to illuminate the way for us. They long for news of home. Okay, so having news from port would probably be a good plan here. So a lot of these people really seem to be lusting after the news. I suppose that what we'll do is we'll launch and we'll do a little turnabout right here. Oh, there's a maelstrom right there. Let's go ahead and lower speed and we're going to do a turnabout. Let's go back to London. And in going back to London, we're going to gather news from the street corner. We're going to bring it to here and we're going to bring it to the sisters. We're going to play this very slow to begin with. Because as you can tell, the place is quite dark and scary. And I feel like if we adventure too aggressively we may find ourselves very much on the rocks or at least you know three sheets annihilated whatever saying you want to use from sailing lore oh dear we have a pirate ship ah hell and it's guarding the port too so there's not going to be anything we can do right there let's kill the lights and maybe he'll lose us the enemy does seem to have a fairly uncanny knack for being able to find you though Oh hell, there's a giant crab over there. Alright, well, we've been exploring for going on like one day, and the best we've found so far is crabs. Pickle crickets, as I like to call them. Cuddle bugs. But, I suppose there are worse things we could have picked up along the way. I'm going to leave the lamps out until... The crabs aren't scary. These little crabs right here are not really a threat. I should... Actually, let's do combat. I'll show you combat before we end this episode so that you know what it's like. And so there we are. These are the younger form of gargantuan Z crabs driven up from their spawning grounds in the south by peculiar radiations. Younger they may be, but they are still large enough to consume a pony with messy and clattering glee, or to pose a menace to ill-prepared ships. It surges from the water, its carapace throbbing with a queasy golden glow. Oh good, things are throbbing in my direction. Well, we could flee very, very easily if we wanted to, or we could fight. I'm going to show you the combat system. And so, we want to increase... Actually, I'll explain it. I explain it better than the the game actually does. So you've got a bunch of things that you want to be aware of right now. You've got the hull for both characters. You've got the crew for either. If it's another ship, they would have their own crew, so you could try and kill off their crew. You've got the distance in between us and the enemy, and we've got the ability to disengage and flee if we wanted to. Combat is paused right now, and you have a bunch of abilities. You have attack abilities, and so devastating salvo and salvo. These require illumination. You see this bar right here? It's how illuminated your enemy is, and you can't take shots until the enemy is illuminated because it's simply too dark. You can't see what they're doing. And so we have illuminate abilities. We can fire flares, which take five seconds to charge up, but it illuminates the enemy slightly, but it illuminates us a little bit as well. We can use our fuel to set the water on fire, which will illuminate the water quite a bit, but it costs us fuel. But... You know, you want to keep your fuel. I mean, it's it costs fuel. What more can I say about it? We can also seek, which reduces the distance in between us and the enemy, and additionally illuminates them slightly. But it has a longer cooldown than firing flares. But that's in trade because you don't illuminate yourself. We also have evasive abilities. There's going to be ones that we want to play with quite a bit, considering we're very, very good with veils. We have evade, which is going to allow you to increase your distance and reduce your illumination. We have flanking speed, which is faster than evade, increases distance, but costs you fuel. It decreases your enemy's illumination. We've got flee, which reduces your illumination slightly and increases your distance so that you can disengage if you really, really wanted to. I think you have to be at least 95 yards away in order to escape. And then we have miscellaneous abilities. We have emergency repairs, which costs you supplies, but allows you to repair the hull very, very quickly. You've also got observe, which is a little bit of the odd man out right now, because this is an ability that allows you to study whatever enemy you're up against, and it allows you to accumulate a thing called observation. 
and once you have 10 observations, you can learn something after the battle about your foe or about just the lore or whatever it is that you're doing. Thus far, I've only used this on two different things, and both times we got one XP for it, so it wasn't really worthwhile. I'm going to start out by illuminating the enemy three times. You can queue up your abilities right here. They each take five seconds, and then we'll fire a salvo. We'll press space bar to begin the combat, and up, up, and away, or off, off, and away. Looks like the enemy's going to try and close distance with us by using seek. So thus far, we're neck and neck. We need 50 illumination to fire the first salvo, so unfortunately it's going to take us one more flare to get it done. And so off with the first salvo we go. It looks like we've taken... Oh, it's searching the darkness. Doesn't matter because we've shot it with our cannons, and now away it is gone. We have a couple of options. With a forlore and wailing cry, the Megalops turns on its back, legs neatly folded, a bluish blood gouts from its wounds. Its golden glow begins to dim. We can butcher it for supplies, which will lower our hunger, which our hunger is very, very high right now. We can dissect it, so we have a 75% chance right there. That'll give us XP in exchange for the fight. I think I'm going to butcher it for supplies because we're about to trade in our own supplies anyways. And so there it is. We've lost 48 hunger, and we saved ourselves a supply right there at the end. Not bad for a day's work. Let's go ahead and turn the ship about. And we're going to dock at the Port of London so that we can gather news for everybody so that we can gossip a little bit and see what we can get out of that. Because I haven't played around with the, goth of the gossip system very much lately. It's just something that I've had gossip on board before, but I've never used it. So I'd like to find out what it does. Let's go ahead and dock here. We'll turn on our lights since we're going into port, and we shouldn't gain any further terror. Yeah, sitting in port for a little while will increase your hunger, but it does reduce your terror slightly. We'll dock right here. And so there we are. We're back in port, and so you get a... You can collect messages from the Harbor Master, but I think it's about time to break off the episode. So my name is Flattercat. Thank you for joining me in the Nerd Castle for another episode of... What is this going on right here? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for joining me in another episode of Sunless Sea. I just got a text message. I apologize. That's going to be a very unprofessional break in my episode. This game is called Sunless Sea. If you're interested, I have all the information down below. You can get it on Steam. Take care out there, everybody, and I do as always.